Okay, so um, now we have a schedule <clears throat> lined up next week. Eric is in the um, is in the um, lineup for next week. We're going to talk about a mysterious experiment you have and yeah, um, do some live coding possibly. Um, then the following week there won't be a meeting. I'm away, and um, I just thought it was easier to to do it that way. Got a volunteer for the following week, which is Hayden, um, who's going to be talking about one of his experiments and a, a binomial linear mixed effects model that we've used for it. And it's an in interesting analysis. I think people will be interested in the um, biological story as well. And then um, for 107, I put myself down again a month from now. Like I said, I'll try to keep up the every four weeks. And if people want to, and it's interesting, we'll carry on with uh, this MLR3. It might be a niche taste, as you'll see. But if you want to follow along, I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint and an R script um, already linked uh, here. And uh, the, the YouTube link is dead, but I'll upload it. And the other ones are updated from previous meetings. So I'll try to keep that up on the new site like I did on the old site. And uh, if you want to follow along with the R script, I'll give people plenty of time, but I'm going to go ahead and start the talk so that we have enough time to get through it. Any um, comments or declarations to start with here? Just get the chat. If, if I could have somebody um, keep an eye on the chat for me, and if there are any comments or questions, just like normal, um, um, yell them out. <clears throat> hey, OK. So let's open up the old PowerPoint. It's very short. Just by way of introduction to the to the set. Now, um, the thing I wanted to say about this package is that I haven't used it very much, you know, never for anything at full speed or uh, an analysis. All of the stuff that this package does, um, historically, I would do it the hard way just from um, other native packages, build my own visualizations, do my own exploratory data analysis. But what this package promises to do is to, it does a couple of things, and it, I've just summarized it here in, in my own words from their, their cast. Well, let me go through these one by one. The efficient object-oriented programming type. Now, let me translate that for non-programming people. What that means is that um, they've written all the code that uh, to make it easier for people who are already proficient at, at real programming. It doesn't necessarily mean it makes it easier for any other person on the planet. <laughs> it, it does it a particular way, and it is standardized in being object-oriented. It, it means two things, really, though, that are, that are hidden in just saying that it's an efficient object oriented programming way. W one thing that it means is the thing I just said, that the formatting of the way you call functions is in a, a modern programmatic way, which, it, which isn't similar. It doesn't even resemble historical R code necessarily. Second thing is that um, I think what they've done is they've optimized some of the actual algorithms that they use. I haven't scratched the surface um, hard enough yet to understand that part, but I think they would say that if I if I wanted to do a random forest classification analysis with a data set with with millions of lines, and I was willing to wait 20 minutes for it to chug along in base R, and it's pretty fast in base R. It's not it's not slow, but I think they might say that because they've implemented um, parallel programming even for tasks using old R libraries. That it would be faster and, and that is also accomplished with object oriented programming style and ideals in a modern framework i think building blocks of machine learning what i think they mean by that is they've cobbled together um, all of those um, things that that i consider machine learning like k-means clustering like random forests like principal component analysis and they've implemented it pretty much across the board here. Um, another thing that they say, this is a bit of a niche thing, is um, R 
uh, has data structures that are contained in objects and the ones that you use all the time, whether or not you think of it this way, are, are summarized um, by being referred to as S3 or S4 objects, S3 or S4 objects. So the why this is important is if you take a, if you run a regression and you put the results of your regression in a, in a um, regression object, if you program along with me, you know, my, my favorite way of calling that would be like LM0, LM1, you know, my linear model object. Those uh, for a plain simple linear regression, they would be, and for any old R, by, by old I mean mature R, non-fancy R um, function, that would be an S3 object. And more recently, um, for flexibility and other reasons, um, new packages have been using, especially RStudio, have pushed this uh, R4 objects that, that have different behaviors according to the classification of the object and the definitions around the object. So the difference between R3 and R4 are that there might be more options or more flexibility for classifications. Now this, uh, S, that's S3 and S4. The R6 object, well, this is the first time I've encountered it. Um, it's, I know that it is, it is something that's possible in the newest versions of R, and uh, I don't know the differences. <clears throat> now the uh, this one geared towards scalability and larger data sets. Um, this sounds pretty good in the old days. And by the old days, I mean about five years and longer ago. Um, there used to be a historical limit on the size of the data set that you could use R for, and it was limited to I think it was two gigabytes for a while. Two gigabytes, which sounded really big. Uh, at, at one time in my life, but today sounds impossibly small. You can almost fit almost no data into two gigabytes. And that was a problem. And then R went through an agonizing series of solutions to that problem. And finally, we don't really have that problem anymore in R. Uh, now we're mostly RAM limited and, and we have hard drive swapping too. I presume what this means is that um, because they mentioned parallelization quite a lot in the documentation, right at the, up at the top and throughout, is that um, they have um, they, they're fully using all the the current implementation of hard drive partition swapping and and parallelization for memory. Uh, but you know, I would like to test that, and one of the chapters in the book does test it. So maybe we could do that next time. I have a question in the chat asking about is there any slides that they brought over this? Are there any slides? I'm, I'm sure. Oh, can you not see my slides? Oh, okay. Not, not on Teams. Okay, hold on. Let me uh, unshare the Teams. <clears throat> no, thanks. No, it's fine. I appreciate you saying it. Now, should be able to see this. And if I make that big, there we go. All right. So I'm just going through, you haven't missed much. You've only missed this list. I'm going through, I'm on the last item now. <laughs> Thanks for saying that. All right, so the um, the other thing that I've already noticed and we'll see today is the something that the designers of this package have done quite a lot is they have, ra rather than having one big package that does everything, they have created a, lots of little packages. I'm reading one between the- Sorry. If if they put it in the chat, if there is something or uh, I heard something, I thought it was a comment or question. I may have misheard. Um, is that they have uh, rather than putting all of the functions and functionality into one package, is they have um, they've made a a little ecosystem of packages. There are at least six or seven packages that are that are a part of it. I think we'll we'll look at at least five or six, just even scratching the surface in, in this uh, script I put together today. And the reason I guess they may have done that, I find it annoying because the packages are quite small that they've done. And so to me, if it's the difference between a two megabyte package or a six megabyte package, you know, 
I, I'd rather have one six megabyte package than five, you know, two megabyte packages. But uh, maybe they have big plans for the future. So uh, I don't I don't fully understand the ecosystem yet. So in my words, I have two slides here that paraphrase and, and Eric will recognize the at least the motif of these slides uh, when I say the next two is that, you know, we want our workflows to be very tidy and small, reproducible, pretty. We want them to be understandable and attractive to other people. But often, especially if you have a data task that um, that involves some exploration, you have a very non tidy workflow that looks very ugly, not reproducible, and it may not it may be broken completely. It may not be fit for purpose. And one of the one of the um, issues that this package that as I see it, a big advantage to it is that it will create a tidy workflow that would be exactly the same no matter what data set you do. You, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And I think that's their purpose. But in my words, that's the big advantage of this particular ecosystem. So I've, I've broken this down a little bit conceptually, and we'll see some parts of this in the script today, is that uh, my workflows, if, if it's a discrete data set, look something like this. I'm just going to go back and um, mute somebody because I hear somebody. I'm just going to mute. How do I mute someone? Satya, can I ask you to mute, please? Getting some background noise. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So, um, my workflows look like this, where if it's a data set that I that I uh, need to explore and and it's a data set, I guess I should probably have put in another slide where I, I think there are two kinds of workflows. These are extremes uh, ex at the extreme of a continuum, but one kind of workflow would be somebody who did an experiment. And if you've done an experiment, you, you should, if you've done your due diligence, have a, a model in mind by which you design the experiment. The other end of the spectrum is you have some data and you actually don't know the model and you need to go through a process to discover a plausible model or a set of plausible models in order for you to conduct your analysis. So this this diagram is that second system, that second situation where you don't necessarily know the um, the model. So you start with your data uh, and during exploratory data analysis, you try it on with multiple models. You don't necessarily know which one is the best and you uh, this also would include um, variable um, munging, variable creation, uh, transformation, data cleaning. And then finally you would arrive at one or a set of models and, uh, and, and you'd perform an analysis, okay? The thing is, though, that this EDA part, um, <clears throat> if it involves data cleaning in particular, uh, as a statistical consultant, but maybe this will, will sound familiar to uh, regular old scientists as well, um, the data cleaning part and the data preparation part and exploring the data, that takes almost all of the time for an analysis. It takes, I mean, as a consultant, uh, as a as a student, I was I was taught to cost in 80 percent of my time just to just to do data stuff before you actually get to the analysis and the communication of it. In in practice, I find that it's the same for applied scientists, even experimental scientists, that most of the work is is messing with the data, exploring the data takes a lot of time and for the analysis this requires uh, to do a great analysis and easily requires a lot of experience that can also take a lot of time but it at least requires a lot of experience okay so this is the advantage of the MLR package um, <clears throat> I've, uh, I've graffitied their logo um, 
what they aim to do is when you apply their methods, they aim to reduce the amount of time and take away subjectivity in the absence of, of experience, possibly. Um, and uh, make it so that the whole process requires less experience to accomplish. And, and there are some objective pipelines put in. I haven't, haven't stress tested them yet. It would be interesting to spend time on a, an analysis in the past, say, say that someone has done, maybe that I've done, and, uh, and re recall all of that diligence that went into it and then compare it to just running it through one of their models and, and say, did it come out resembling the choices that, uh, that I may have made? OK. So uh, just a few other things <clears throat> is. Um, it seems like I have periodically heard a little bit about the MLR package that they've just come out with a new version called MLR three and they've um, been investing in communicating it. So I. The, the authors of the package and the authors of the. Um, the that have been continuous from, you know, 2013. Have been uh, doing talks and um, such and so forth, and this is their third major version. And they have said that it's improved, it's faster, it's easier to use. Um, after scratching the surface a little bit, I ho I hope it's easier to use because it's still not easy to use. Uh, at least it's not that intuitive, but it is consistent, which um, I do have a lot of appreciation for. But also, they've written a book. I'm just going to show you this site real quick. <clears throat> so they've got the bare, bare skeleton of an open access book, and I've got the link to the book that's uh, also on the page. And if you go around to um, their GitHub pages and, and this book page and, and the official manual for MLR3 that is linked to from CRAN, um, you can see that these guys I mean, I look at these guys and I think I don't know any of them, but I think they're one of us. You know, they, they're scientists. They've created some tools and they've shared it on in the spirit of, um, you know, I've, I've put some work into something and I hope somebody else can make use of it. So I think this has really been done in earnest. And I have a disclosure to make as well is that the, the, they want to publish this book. And the editors contacted me to review it in its current state. So uh, that's what gave me the idea to do this. So I, I will be doing some more and you can do it with me if people are, are really interested. OK, so um, their, their manual is decent, uh, it, but it's very tutorial like. I don't find this. Um, it's not in a state it's in now. It's not book like it's more of a bare manual. Um, I think I did have a joke slide in there, but I got interrupted right before I walked to the um, to the room here and I didn't get that one saved in time apparently. OK, so what I'm going to do is go back here. Now, if you want to follow along with the R script, I'll give everybody time to do that. So the first thing to do would be to download it. I'm going to do it from scratch with you. So uh, you would make a, um, a folder. I'm just going to make mine on the desktop. I'm going to make a um, uh, new folder. And I'm going to call it um, MLR3. And I'm going to drag script in there. And then I'm going to open it up. Now I'll give everybody just a minute to, to do that. So uh, as I've opened it up, because I haven't run this script on my my computer yet, not this this computer. I've only run it on my desktop. Um, I'm getting the uh, this little utility asking me if I want to install these libraries I'm loading. So I'm going to go ahead and do that on this occasion. Sarah, is this for our proper not our students? Um, well, the um, 
the dot r extension is just the generic um, r script extension and if we think of r as uh, as it is as a separate piece of software from r studio r is the piece of software that um, actually does the statistics actually reads in the data uh, actually makes the plots and r studio is really a um, a um, uh, just a, an interface, an environment that makes has a few um, conveniences for you, like making the text different color and providing all these windows for you but without having to invoke them. And so uh, if your computer doesn't um, recognize the .r script, um, what you can do is just start R Studio and open the script that way manually from the file menu. Just open the file from wherever you downloaded it. <clears throat> so I'll just give people a, a moment to open it. And um, <clears throat> further, I'll, I'll in the text in the chat, I'll drop this little piece of syntax. Uh, this is for Windows. And if you put um, your file path in the middle of there, you can just copy and paste it to set your working directory. Of course, there are other ways to set your working directory, like um, like from the session. Let me see, where is it? I usually do it with code, but um, <clears throat> you can set your working directory from the session drop-down button to the source file location. That's another way to do it without any code. I tend to hard code it like this. I'll just drop this in the chat in case people want to do that. Save you a few keystrokes. I'll show you on the website. <clears throat> the um, it's on the schedule page that uh, I think push uh, um, Yes, thank you. Put in the the um, URL and it's right here. The link to the script is right there. So you just need to click on it to download it. You could run it from your um, downloads if you wish. Usually I would make a folder where it lives. <clears throat> I'll just give people a, a minute to um, to do that. Yeah, it has today's date. <clears throat> if you use the uh, ISO date format standard, all of your files will always be automatically sorted for you. That's the way that I roll. <laughs> OK. Well, I give another minute for um, people to set up. I'm just going to change my color scheme back to a little bit of a darker one. I feel my eyeballs are being burned from my skull here. Can't remember why I um, <clears throat> why I had that one. Maybe I'll put a gentler one than that one. Okay, I'll try solarized. Oh yeah, let me just restart. There we go. OK. OK, I think I'm going to go on in the interest of time. OK. So if you like to um, follow along with the table of contents of built one in like a like. You can follow along. I'll keep the text big. If uh, if you need it bigger, just uh, say in the chat and I'm happy to click up a little bit, but this is a good size to start with. Now. Um, I usually would just comment out. These um, I'm going to use the hotkey, which is uh, one that is one I recommend remembering if you do a lot of scripting, so control shift C. 
It's <clears throat> control forward slash for Python. If anyone is, uh, likes to keep track of those. But you need a couple of libraries. Um, the main package library is just MLR3, but you'll definitely want to have MLR3 viz as well at minimum. And these other ones are ones that um, that uh, do more fancy things. Some of them, um, some of them are probably not necessary for most sessions, but I'll go ahead and load these uh, anyway. I think that not all of these successfully downloaded, and I didn't go to the um, the extra trouble of uh, downloading them from GitHub. And so don't worry about the error. The MLR3 Praba that hasn't loaded, just let's forget about that. And uh, maybe if we need it for something in the next one. The learners is another one that you'll have to have for almost every session. I'll explain that in a moment. I'm going to skip the extra learners. Got a second line for the Praba. I'm going to delete that second line. And the cluster. <clears throat> OK, is everybody? Um, OK, thank you. Someone's gone. All right, so the first the first big thing, uh, the really just two big topics that um, you'd need to keep in mind. These are the bare minimum to do anything in this package. They're uh, the concept of tasks and the concept of learners. OK. Now a task, I'll just say it verbally before I start going through the data. Uh, a task is a structure that defines aspects of data um, in, in, and aspects of uh, the information you're going to create from that data. And you, you have to do that right at the start before you can do almost anything else in this package. So before you do anything, there's some jargon you have to take on board and yet you, you have to roll with it because you can't do anything in this package with it. Now the jargon will, if you're used to traditional statistics, will not make any sense at all. You know, maybe why would we have a task? Why call it a task? Why, why create a term for it? Well, the origin of this jargon is in uh, data science, the modern practice of data science. And so I'll, I'll point out some of the origins of the jargon terms as we come up on them. The concept of a learner is, uh, is a specific model that you're going to apply to a task. And they have a lot of tools for you to rapidly um, mutate different learners, OK? So if you're going to follow along, the code should work mostly, but I'll highlight places where the code wasn't working for me. Um, we're going to start off with that MT cars package. It's one of the standard data sets. You can read about it later if you want, but the important ones that we're going to um, use are um, it's a data set that has miles per gallon. And then for, e for each of many different models of cars, and then for each of those cars, it's got the number of cylinders, the displacement of the engine, and other, other variables, OK? What this syntax means is we're going to take the whole MT cars data set. I'm just going to print it out in the console. Three, two, one. So it's a there's a lot of stuff, and these are the cars that are row names in this particular one. And what we're doing is we're grabbing. If we just go to the top where the names are, this one to three is just shorthand for grabbing the um, the first three um, variables. So miles per gallon, cylinder displacement. And then we'll just um, look at this str function to look at the structure down in the console. Three, two, one. Okay. So we can see some of the values. So this is super simple. It's just for an example for our first um, task. <clears throat> so um, if I scroll out, I'm not going to scroll out. I'm gonna, just going to do that. Um, here's the second little bit of jargon for creating a task from scratch do this a couple of times in the script, and it's like the basic thing. Can't do anything else without a task. This it has got a target argument, and the target argument is um, the thing that um, you're predicting. It's your dependent variable. It's just the data science jargon for that. And um, 
the uh, the ID of the task is just a string that you're going to use to access the name of the task. You know, I, I think they mean this to be more readable, but uh, it wasn't very intuitive to me. And you can just leave it at the default. So this doesn't have to do with any data or a data object that we're loading up. All we do is define um, for this data subset our data object, our dependent variable, and everything that's not a dependent variable automatically becomes a predictor or a feature in data science jargon. So if we just print our task, a summary of it. Oops, I didn't execute my task um, thing. Line 48, three, two, one, boom. And then I'm going to print it in the console, three, two, one. So what we see is we've got um, 32 rows, three columns. Our target is miles per gallon. And our features are cylinders and displacement. We haven't defined any properties. Maybe we'll come on to that and talk about that. For now, let's just look at um, a, they have this function called autoplot. Now, I think they're taking the autoplot function from, uh, if you guys have used, um, if you're a heavy ggplot user, uh, autoplot is one of the tools from ggplot. They have maybe through the R6 uh, definition of objects, they have done something super fancy with it. This one is really boring compared to some of them, but I'll make the plot bigger. You can see the first autoplot, three, two, one. Whoops. GG Galley, I probably haven't installed um, that. So I, I will need to install GG Galley. I'm going to set um, depth equals to true, the dependencies equal to true. I'll put this in the, um, I think I need a um, quotes on that. I'll put this line in the chat, so you might need to do it too if you haven't installed it. While that's loading, I'll just put that in chat. Forgetting that error, you'll need to install that. That dep equals to true. I can't remember what I've installed on this. I don't do a lot of coding on this little um, tablet that I'm working on. So the dependencies equal to true just automatically installs all the dependencies. <clears throat> now, every time I load ggplot or tidyverse and I see all of the millions of uh, dependent, well, millions, okay, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but uh, there are there are scores of dependencies and it is kind of annoying. How spoiled um, we've become is the internet is so fast and this just it just works just about every time. But it, I'm still annoyed watching the bar, even if it only lasts 60 seconds or so. <laughs> OK. OK, I'm just scanning my console for all successes, all successes and no fails. I'm pretty good at watching it, and I, it was all successes on that occasion. So um, let us know in chat if anybody does have problems, and we'll, we'll pause and help. But uh, we'll go ahead and run that auto plot in the meantime. I, <clears throat> that's um, line 53. I'm just going to um, make that big. Three, two, one. There we go. So it, it took a second to render that plot because there were some calculations going on. Now, I didn't get any um, any feedback in the console about what calculations might have been going on, but we'll see one in a second where there's more calculation. But what we get in this is kind of a fancy pairs plot. You remember the base pairs plot, if you've seen it, is just a, uh, if you have all, um, all uh, numerical and categorical variables like this, um, the pairs plot would, would just do scatter plots uh, both above the um, central axis and below it, and the central axis on a standard pairs plot has got the names of the variables, the identity um, of it. But we get some extra fancy stuff. We get a density line for each of the variables. We get um, 
scatter plots for some of them and we get a correlation coefficient with the sign. So it is nicer and functional, but hold on to yourself because that one is pretty boring compared to some of the um, some of the fancier ones. We have in some built in example tasks um, and we can list them. <coughs> Let's just have a look at some of them. Um, <clears throat> they'll list down in the console three, two, one. And remember, you may or may not remember that there was a library I didn't load up above that was extra tasks. It's like MLR extra tasks. So there are quite a, they have quite a few of them. The ones that we'll use today are um, the MT cars. They have an Iris one, but I, I built my own Iris one down below. And it's really easy to do that. They have this, the penguins one that's, you know, um, exactly like Iris, but with penguins. And they have one that's a famous, um, textbook data set on um, on um, diabetes in Native American Pima uh, Native Americans. <clears throat> OK, so um, and we can. There are some attributes with each of those tasks. So if we look at the um, attributes as a data frame. We can um, see a summary because my um, text is is big. <clears throat> we can see one for the task types. Um, I didn't really linger on it to say that there are different task types, but there is um, clustering, classification and regression and some other more specialized ones. But in their examples, they just have those three very common ones and they have a, you know, at a glance, you can see how big the data sets and um, some other some other attributes of the data that we can just ignore for now. So these are ones just to explore the functions um, of, <clears throat> of the tasks. OK, and they have an example here. This one's the fancier one, and it'll take a second to run. Before I run it, though, I want to set you to pay attention to a few things. This one's the penguins data set. It has three different um, species of penguins. I think it's three, and they've measured certain um, um, morphological characteristics of the penguins, and it's used to classify species based on those morphological characteristics. Just a classification example data set. It's a classic, modern classic. If we load that in and we print it out, we can see it's got 344. Okay, it's got it's got more than three. It's got uh, well, it's got eight variables, 344 rows. Uh, Honeymoon slipper island sex. It's got sexes as well. Okay. Um, but watch what happens down in the console when we run this auto plot. Now, remember we did the first one on just a few variables, and this one's on a lot more variables. So while it's calculating, it's doing some stuff down there. And what it's doing is um, it's analyzing the features that are used to predict species, and it's setting the graphics parameters automatically for us. And that that is actually a very difficult part. I'm just going to pop this out so that we can see it. Uh, zoom in. Boop. I mean, uh, this is a pretty good looking graph to start with. There's a lot going on. And this is the kind of thing that summarizes for a data set like this. Almost every exploratory data summary you would want to do. And this is good enough that it's something that I'll, I would probably put in my toolbox. The thing that makes me say probably and not definitely is that you have to load a bunch of janky packages all the time first, and that's slightly annoying to me to do that. So, but it does look really nice and it probably would be very useful. Some of the things that are nice, that, that are just nice little things that I notice on this are that we're getting quite a lot of information that's appropriate to all of the different variables, like the uh, island one. We're getting um, box plots that are color coded by the uh, by the species. That's a pretty nice attribute. That's very nice. We can't quite see all of the detail here because there's so many variables, but we get um, summary statistics and overall correlation and a individual correlation. In th this case, it's um, body mass by bill length. OK, so we're getting descriptive statistics and aggregated by species we get these 
just lovely looking um, cluster grams and um, uh, color coded density charts. I, I like this quite a lot. I think it's great. <clears throat> Useful. Not just pretty. Um, now you think of the task as a as a data set with um, extra information. I just want to check the chat. Is everybody OK? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> So if we wanted to pull out individual attributes, remember this is the um, back to the MT cars. If we wanted to pull out individual features, we can exploit that. We might want to do that for all sorts of reasons. Um, um, rather than printing out a summary, we might want to exploit it to um, set a loop or set some attribute for a graph. So we can pull out the um, numbers of rows, feature names, the target name, and a lot of other stuff too for bigger data sets. We can also grab the whole um, data frame with a. Now this syntax is very modern. It's um, I don't know if they're emulating Python in particular, but they're they're emulating a modern language where you're a, applying a uh, an attribute function or a summary function to a uh, data object, and they're doing it. They're doing it in a way that's not typical R syntax. And the thing I love about this, now this is the feature, the object, and then this is um, the data um, function that is applied to feature. Here's a nice thing. It's just a nice little thing. I noticed that when you print out a data frame in R, the if it's a long data frame, the column names are up at the top and they print it out for you again at the bottom. It's just so clever. It's so useful too. Pretty nice. So we can we can summarize um, the task itself if we convert it to a data table first. So it would drop all the metadata three, two, one. So we can you can apply base R ones too if we convert back to a data table. OK, and then also this is a I find this. I don't do a lot of programming in a lot of languages, but um, I've been using Python in recent years more. Um, more and more, not as much as R, but still I, I do use it more and more. And um, this I find very Python-like, <clears throat> the idea of, of mutators. So it's a, um, it's a way that uh, when you're slicing bits from your data set, um, you would use, or, or maybe summarizing bits of your data set, usually you would use some code and it's easy to do with the um, square brackets notation in R and it's um, easy to do with uh, in the tidyverse language with pipes. So we, we do that kind of stuff that way. But here they've done it in a, a Pythonic way. If I just collapse my uh, table of contents for a moment. <clears throat> here we're um, applying functions again to the data object to uh, select and filter. And uh, whereas we would use a pipe, putting in a data object into the filter function um, to grab, in this case, uh, a certain set of rows, and then have have the syntax explicit to pipe that um, into a, a new data object or the same data object. Here it's implicit. So th this will filter the data object small. Here I've, I've made um, a new task that I call small penguins. If we summarize it, we see it's the full penguins. It's not small at all. But the, <laughs> to keep it straight, um, what we can do, note there are eight um, columns in the whole task penguins. This TSK, by the way, is a, a shorthand word for grabbing their task by its ID name. OK, so that's just it's just to keep the code terse and readable. It serves no other function. We could do it with less readable code. It's, an, it's a subjective thing, a little thing, but it, it, it's kind of nice. I can see it if you're using if only this package and none of no other package, maybe. But um, if we select those particular variables with this syntax, boom, and then print out our new t um, task, we've selected those. And if we're going to filter it by row, we run this three, two, one, and we print it again. 
boom, we filtered it down to three rows. So it's implicit, the pipeline, the pipes, uh, it, it makes the pipes syntax completely obsolete. That's all, but you have to be careful <laughs> and know what you're doing, that's all. So we can look at the whole data set now and we see that we've just sliced it. That's pretty nice, that's pre it's pretty nice. It's uh, different than any other thing I've done, which is a huge um, downside. You know, you have to learn it explicitly, and but it is easy to learn and it seems to work. So for plotting, I think we've already loaded that. We're going to load up the, um, this is again using the TSK for the nickname for the task and just put it in a generic object called task this time, which we can print. This has got six, seven, uh, seven, six, eight rows of nine variables, just keeping an eye on the time because I've got the other sessions starting soon. See, we're only halfway through, so I'm going to go really fast to get through to the end. So um, <clears throat> we're going to subset it, boom. We're going to um, auto plot class frequencies for this task. I think this um, window will be big enough. So because we've um, plotted something that's got um, just classes, this is the two classes, positive or negative. It just the default is to, on the dependent to just do the frequency. Let's do a pairs plot on the whole task. Three, two, one. It's probably going to be too big for this window. Notice it's setting the graphics parameters in the console. It said the bin width was too small. Try to print it. There we go. Took it a second, but you get um, with a classification problem as opposed to a regression problem. You get a different um, plot. Again, I presume that's the R6 object just doing its work behind the scenes. You don't even need to know what it what it means. Um, three, two, one, so-called duo plot that takes these categories and makes box plots. So to visually um, compare for the same classification, different variables in a stacked box plot kind of way. The other big idea I said was learners. Okay, so this is, um, I've, I've written the text of how the authors describe learners <coughs> from their manual. I may have edited it a little bit to make it shorter. <coughs> but essentially they say that if you're a data scientist and you want to do some machine learning, that if you can accept the concept of learner, they would provide you with a one unified um, set of syntax to do any techniques. And I could say for the for the guys that have done my 7081 class, the machine learning class, this does everything. This this one package and concept and framework will do everything we did in that course. Of course, we use many, many packages in the course, and it was a lot to learn. I don't know if this is easier. I don't know if it's easier, but the authors would say, oh, yeah, it's a lot easier, guys. Use our package instead. So that's what they say that they do. They want to do anything that you want to do. We can do it. We will do it. And it's the same interface. And for that, it, it will work. So I've got some stuff in here I'm not going to read through, but um, there are a lot of learners. Let's print um, some of them. This is, ju this is just some of them. I just want to classify a few of them. Um, we have uh, generalized linear models. We have um, K nearest neighbors. Um, unsupervised clustering, uh, linear discriminant analysis, that's classification, uh, it's a classification tool. Um, we have various kinds of trees, support vector machines, uh, some uh, HCLUST, so more, more tree-based methods. Um, binomial regression is in there. XG boost, so uh, modern implementations of of classification and regression trees like random forest. It's got a lot of stuff in there. You know, it'll take you a while to do it. Everything in in the book from our class is in there. <clears throat> so uh, when you look at a learner, we're going to um, do um, a partition classification uh, using the R part package. So uh, we're going to define our learner. We can print our learner down in the um, console, just a summary of, of what it does. Now, this is just a, a summary of the, the model 
the modeling approach, the pipeline, the analysis pipeline, and we can look at parameters. So some things like, like say random forest or this, uh, this R part classification algorithm are going to have parameters and it's wrapped around so it looks bad, but um, this would be different for every kind of learner. For random forest, it would be the number of trees and the, um, how many features per sample that you do. So, you know, this is stuff you have to learn, but they have default settings. So you actually, as a, as a, you know, uh, someone who's learning and building your toolbox, you can start to use this stuff without having to worry about how it's imp implemented differently. Here it's unified um, for every, every method. So we can look at particular values that you can change. So here we haven't done anything uh, other than the default, and we could change the um, a particular value directly, and then look at the values that we've changed. Okay, so that's a very quick way of looking into that. And load our Pima task. We're going to um, make our learner for classification. And then we're going to look at our learner model, which we haven't specified yet, so it's null. So once we run a model, this model object will be populated with a classification model. So let's just do that first. If we train on the task that we made, so we're taking our learner, taking the train function, and training it on our task, three, two, one. That trained really fast. We can look at our model. So this is a tree partition for branches for classifying diabetes. So, you know, it, it's hard to look at, but uh, for this one for glucose, it measured glucose in the patients. Basically what we see is um, there's a split at um, uh, being greater than or equal to the measurement 157, and we had 92 and 12 cases at that split as a predictor. OK, so that's how you read this. I just I added in a, a conventional plot. The authors would be horrified at this. But if you want to see like the um, what the tree would look like, you can see the hierarchy of the tree based on their object. And you probably could label it, too, if you wanted to go to the trouble of figuring it out, which I didn't. But uh, we we just made in this one a little data object that's um, all the uh, predictor variables in this data set, but leaves off the um, the diagnosis. So I'm just going to do that real quick. Show our new one, and then we can use it. To predict new data, they have a little function to predict on from any of these tools and the syntax exactly the same, no matter what the tool. This will be the last code I run. So I'm going to make the prediction three, two, one, and then we'll get a uh, we've only got. It's not very exciting. We should have a list of predictions here based on those data. Three, two, one, boom. So for row one, it predicts positive, and we didn't have a truth on this, so we didn't add in a ground truth for the training data set on this. We're out of time. Um, maybe we'll take a survey closer to the time if we want to carry on with this. There's more to it. I think it's pretty neat. I'm going to look at it some more because I'm interested in it. I'm reviewing the book, but uh, I've got to rush over to my office now and uh, maybe somebody else who can start the uh, other session and I'll see you over there in a minute. I'm well, sorry to leave hastily, but we've gone right down to the time.